after the rise of Christianity in Rome, the church became the highest institution that would look after all the religious practices and services of the religion of Christianity. And it, it also became the religion that supported everyday life of the people as well as controlled their lives. So this particular institution controlled the life of the kings to the peasants, right? And also they had the power to control one's birth to death and even in the afterlife. Now church in literal sense means the house of the Lord, right? And it was initiated as a prayer house, as a place where the services would take place by Jesus' followers. Now, in Hinduism as well, you know that there are Brahmins, right? There are these people who are religious people and they are the ones who do these religious practices for this particular religion that is Hinduism. Similarly so, for Christianity and the church, these people who perform these religious practices or services are called the clergy, right? So they are the priests and the officials who form this clergy. Now, once we move into the Middle Ages and we see a you know, steep rise in Christianity, we see that during that time already the hierarchy in this particular religion had been made. So the church also had established this sort of a hierarchy that would, you know, maintain these services one by one. So the Pope, of course, was the highest. Then came the cardinals, the bishop and the archbishops, the priests, and last was the abbot who handled the monastic order or the monasteries. Do you remember who was the first pope in Christianity? Right? So the first pope who was considered as the head in Christianity was Saint Peter, who was given the keys of heaven directly by Jesus Christ. Right? So the pope therefore derives his authority from God, from Jesus Christ. And Saint Peter was the first pope after him. All the popes who succeed him divine that divine authority from uh, Saint Peter. And after that, they derive that divine authority from Saint Peter. So, of course, Pope is the head followed by the cardinals who act as advisors to the Pope and they also manage the administration of the church. Now, the archbishops or the bishops are the heads for the regional churches, okay? The priests are the ones who manage the town churches or the village churches and the monastic supervisors who are called the abbots look into the monasteries and the functioning of these monasteries. When Rome became the center in Christianity, the Pope derived that authority and became the person who is called the Bishop of Rome. So just like the bishops who are the heads in um, uh, the regional areas, Pope is the head of the church in Rome and he also presides over all of the bishops. Okay? Now Pope means, literally means father. Okay? And he had the supreme power because he was the head. He had the supreme power over all the churches. And he also exercised religious and political powers. So in later history, we see that these popes are so very powerful that the kings and the you know, knights, they kneel down in front of him. So he has a particular political authority as well. right? So he was so strong 
that the kings in Europe had also, uh, you know, uh, they also had to maintain a particular adherence to this pope. Can you tell me who the pope of Rome is right now? Right? So that will be Pope Francis. Now, bishop was the head in these regional areas and he was the one who headed these churches. Okay. So, a bishop was also the person who would appoint a priest. Now, who were these priests? Priests were, of course, the ones who handled the churches of the towns and the villages. So, he would appoint or he would ordain a priest. If you look at this picture, you can see that a bishop is ordaining a priest here, right? So, what would ordain mean, therefore? Ordaining would mean or ordain would mean to hand over the responsibilities or the authority to rule over the church in those particular areas. Now, after the priest comes the clergy. Now, if we look at the, um, you know, structure here, we see that we have higher clergy and we have lower clergy, okay. The higher clergy were the people, you know, the kings and the knights and the barons and all of them. Now, the lower clergy were the people who were religious, who were equally religious like the bishops or uh, the priests or even the higher clergy. But the only difference was that these were either poor people or they belonged to the lower class. Okay? They did not have that amount of money as the higher clergy. So basically the lower clergy then would be the common people, right? So, if we look at the institution of the church, apart from the churches being spread over all across the, uh, you know, globe, uh, there was also another institution that was established so that the people who are religiously attached to this, uh, you know, uh, religion that was Christianity, they could devote their time in, in studying about Christianity, in learning these religious practices. So where did they do it? They performed all of those activities in a monastery. So basically monastery would then be a place or uh, you know uh, an institution where these monks and nuns, the monks and nuns would live and they would devote their time in learning about God and the services that they were to provide to God, right? Now, these monasteries were usually, you know, located in many, very far away areas. For example, these monasteries would be located in hilltops or desert or very secluded and isolated areas. The reason for that was that these monasteries included the people who would need time, peace and solace to involve in the study of God. So they needed to devote all their time, devote all their time to the life of God, right? Because they had to devote their time and their life to God, right? But then you might have a question as to, you know, if they lived in secluded areas, how did they, um, you know, how did they carry on with their day-to-day -day life? So these monks and nuns and the people who lived in monasteries, they usually were independent, right? They took a training in, you know, making their own food, they could make their own clothing, and they could also perform the day-to-day -day activities by themselves. So they could sustain themselves, okay? So that kind of an institution was established for people to live in it, okay? Monks and nuns, right? So now, these people who were living in these monasteries were also the people who used to, you know, um, paint pictures of Jesus Christ or Mary, and they used to also write down. When we were studying about Bible, we, uh, you know, 
when we were studying about the bible we know that these bibles were all handwritten right so after that point of time because there was no printing or anything so they used to these monks and nuns were the ones who used to rewrite them for recording purposes now if we look at the monasteries given here the pictures the first is the ostrog monastery which is in montenegro the second the gelati monastery in georgia and the third is saint catherine's monastery in egypt or senai now one thing that you can of course locate from these monasteries is that they are all placed in very secluded places right this this particular monastery is in a hill top where no other uh, you know person can be seen this is in a desert so of course they had to you know have that peace of mind to deliver these activities that they were assigned so therefore who were these monks and nuns these were the people who would uh, you know uh, devote all their uh, time in these monasteries and would withdraw that is the most important part would withdraw from the world and pursue the spiritual goals the spiritual goals in life now around 530 a monk called benedict you know he was the first person who established a monastery in italy and he set certain rules by which these monasteries would function and also for the governance of the monastic life right so what were the rules so they had to take three main vows okay the first vow would be obedience to the abbess or the abbot okay the person who headed the monastery second would be poverty and third would be chastity or purity so of course poverty would be you know having everything in a limit right not nothing extravagant in life and the third was of course chastity and purity so that they could retain a pure soul now the monasteries and convents often provided basic services if you remember we did discuss about the fact that you know christianity grew at a point of time when the basic services for example medicine doctors hospitals these were not available and surely not for the common people the poor right so these monasteries and convents became the institutions that would provide them with these basic services of food shelter and also the medical services that they would require so they gave food to the travelers and also provided lodging they looked after the poor and the sick they also set up schools sometimes now if you look at the picture here you see that a monk is uh, you know writing uh, certain things he is writing and rewriting from books right so monks or nuns or the institution of monasteries were the place from where a lot of uh, you know educational advancement also took place so uh, from the monasteries you know subjects like grammar mathematics philosophy all of this was pursued and just like we see in this picture they performed the vital role of preserving writings from the ancient world so like we discussed there was no printing and they were the only ones rewriting it now if we look at certain important monks we have already discussed about saint benedict who established these rules we have saint francis and saint augustine all of these monks you know they kept preaching about the monastic life and also the religion christianity by which they gained a lot of followers so saint jerome was one of these mm, uh, saints right who also helped to establish and you know spread christianity now he is very important because he was the one who translated the bible from hebrew to latin 
right? He was the first person who did that. Now, that became very important because the Bible which was written in Hebrew could not uh, always be understood by the layman, right? So what St. Jerome did was he translated this Bible and that version was called the Vulgate, which became the common version. The meaning of Vulgate is the common version and Vulgate became the most used, um, you know, form of Bible, the one which he translated. So let's look at a video where we can see how the religion of Christianity. So let's look at a video where we can see how the religion of Christianity is spreading across the Roman Empire as well as beyond it. Here we can see that the Roman Empire marked in red is slowly decreasing whereas Christianity marked in white is increasing slowly. And here through the passage of time we see with the decline of Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire is right here where Christianity is spreading across. So as we saw that Christianity spread across uh, the Roman Empire as well as beyond its borders, right? So here you can see how it has already gained vast grounds and it has covered, you know, major portions of Europe. We have Africa as well as uh, certain portions of Asia that Christianity has already spread. Right, but there is also a change that we can locate around 600 or 636 AD. Can you locate the change? It's right here in the Arabian Peninsula where a new religion called Islam is gaining its ground as well. So do you think um, there will be any clashes between these two religions? So as we saw across the time how Christian churches got organized and they institutionalized the religion of Christianity. By doing so, they protected and preserved the moral values in the society as well as promoted learning. Apart from the church, the monks and the nuns also played a very vital role in spreading of Christianity across the globe. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. You can also register for free at deltastep.com or download the Delta Step app to get access to all our 5000 plus amazing videos as per your school syllabus. Master each topic with our adaptive practice technology. Get million plus questions with step by step solutions and unlimited mock tests. Get all your doubts resolved instantly, learn via games and win amazing prizes like playstations and iPads. So, at Delta Step, learning is not just fun and easy, it is rewarding too. So, register for free now.